Everybody ready? Okay. Hello, and welcome to the Capitol Planning Commission. This meeting is open to the public with, per with both in-person attendance at City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote viewing is also possible. The Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and mem members of the public wanting to offer public comment need to be present. The public can live stream the meeting on the city's website on YouTube or on Zoom following the link on the meeting agenda. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T U-verse Channel 99 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. And our technician tonight is, did we get the technician? Quinn? Okay, thank you. Um, and as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Thank you. Okay, so roll call. Commissioner Essie. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Vice Chair Jensen. Here. Chair Christensen. Here. Thank you. And then Pledge of Allegiance. Item, moving on to item two is additions and deletions to the agenda. We have two items. That's right. Staff received additional materials for items 6A and 6C. Item 6A received one email. Item 6C received two emails. All materials were made available to the public and the commission before this meeting. Thank you. Uh, item three is oral communications. Is there anybody who'd like to speak? Hi, my name is Goran Klopic. I play basketball almost every day at J Street Park. I have something uh, that uh, caught my eye actually at the J Street Park. It's uh, that people leave garbage around uh, there where kids play or that there is also alcohol consumption there uh, where children play. So I think it's not a good idea to let that happen. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, moving on to item four, or um, excuse, yeah, four, planning commission and staff comments. Are there any staff comments or commission comments? Sorry. I'd like to just make one announcement that the city has kicked off their strategic planning process to really uh, look at what the future of the city of Capitola is going to be. And, and when the city council is making decisions, really re being able to reflect uh, the perception of the community. So uh, I encourage everyone to go to our website at cityofcapitola.org. There's a large uh, button on when you first get there that says strategic planning. You click on that, it'll go directly to our survey and it'll be up for I think the next three weeks and we're just trying to get as much public input as possible. So just getting the word out. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, Katie, I also have an announcement. Good evening, planning commissioner. As you probably are already aware, we are currently actively recruiting for all of the city's boards and commissions, including the planning commission, if you haven't already. This is a reminder to submit an application to be reappointed. And if you have any members of the public who are interested in applying for another city advisory body, please recommend that they submit an application. We'll be making appointments at a city council meeting at the end of the year. Thank you. And one thing, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, could you talk maybe about the this weekend uh, event that's going to be on the wharf? Uh, oh, yes. Um, so this Sunday, there's a special event on the wharf. And I believe the hours are from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And there'll be food trucks and music. And it's to um, raise money for homeless pets or for, for the animal shelter in, in um, the city of Santa Cruz. Um, and I think Santa Darius will be there as the with the beer garden and a couple of different food trucks. So live music, food, and a beer garden. So hope the public can come out and 
support the animal shelter as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other mission comment? Okay. Moving on to um, consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the Planning Commission to be routine and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. So I need to recuse myself from the minutes. So if you could do a motion on them separately, that would okay. be helpful. All right. Um, item A is being pulled to be separate. Is that okay? Do we have a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the um, minutes from the meeting from September 19th. Second. Okay, first and a second. Commissioner Westman. Uh, I'm abstaining. Pardon. Commissioner Wilk. Uh, aye. Vice Chair Jensen. Aye. Chair Christensen. Aye. Okay, item B is uh, 510 Escalona Drive. Does anybody want to pull that item or? I'd just like to make a comment on that item. As I was as I was reading the uh, the um, conditions, I was a little surprised to see the requirement of not using pea gravel um, in the driveway. I thought that was a little bit of a, a stretch in terms of uh, what we should require as a as a staff. Um, uh, but beyond that, since the applicant didn't mind, I don't think that should slow anything down. And, I will, um, having said that, uh, propose a um, uh, that uh, that we you know, I move that we approve. I should say that that item. Okay. So we have a motion to approve the consent. I'll second. Okay. Okay. First and a second. We have a roll call. Commissioner Westman. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Jensen? Aye. Chair Christensen? Aye. All right. Items approved. Moving on to item six, public hearings. The public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed on the public hearing. The following procedure is as follows. This is first, staff presentation. Second, planning commission questions. Third, public comment. And fourth, planning commission deliberation. And fifth, decision. Item A is 1210 41st Avenue. We have a staff report. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Christensen and members of the commission. The clerk is going to help me out with a slideshow. As soon as they pull it up, I'll get started. All right, so uh, subject matter is 1210 41st Avenue. Uh, what you're looking at is a tenant change uh, and a request to modify the conditional use permit to allow off-site uh, distilled liquor sales. Uh, and this is in the Begonia Plaza. Uh, go ahead and next slide, please. So currently, this is the New Leaf. Uh, and New Leaf it was established in the early 1990s. Uh, their current operations allow beer and wine sales. And New Leaf is in the process of transitioning out of the space. And the new tenant, who is the applicant this evening, uh, will be moving in. And that's Grocery Outlet. And so Grocery Outlet is, is, has put forward this request to expand their, uh, their sales offering of liquor and a liquor aisle in the store. Next slide, please. And so they've provided us with the site plan. This is a pretty detailed schematic of the interior um, but I'll call your attention to the purple shaded area. So this would be the reach-in cooler and then aisles associated with beer, wine, and liquor. And then for your orientation, the front entry uh, is shown there with the arrow. Next slide. So with the conditional use permit uh, modification, there's four considerations for uh, the planning commission's operating characteristics and external impacts availability of adequate public services, potential impacts to the environment, and then the physical suitability of the site for the proposed use. Next slide, please. So with this site specifically, and uh, in the course of working on it, uh, staff did receive a couple of complaints. And then as mentioned, as the additional materials, we received some, a uh, couple of letters from nearby residents um, 
reiterating the same uh, complaints that uh, are ongoing. And I will just point out that Gross Real is not the current tenant, so these complaints were, were filed against New Leaf, um, but they relate to employee noise, uh, trash compaction, and trash collection. Uh, there was a comment about uh, requesting limited store hours and then an area of an unsecured side yard that uh, is an area where there's loitering and sometimes noise. Go ahead and next slide, please. So in working with the applicant uh, and also green waste, staff is uh, recommending a couple of conditions to hopefully uh, mitigate some of the concerns raised. So for example, condition number two, the applicant has agreed to install a fence or a gate to enclose that open side yard area. Uh, staff has communicated with Green Waste and their route manager specifically, and the route manager has reported that they're going to move the uh, the pickup to a later time at this location after 8 a.m. Or, or before 5 p.m. And really, that's not a store function; that's a function of the city's waste hauler. Uh, so we were able to uh, to get them to uh, pick up at a better hour, and then we're recommending condition 17 uh, would limit use of the trash compactor to 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then deliveries to the store would be limited Monday through Friday 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and staff is not specifically recommending store hours um, with the report presented this evening. Next slide please. So just giving you a bit of perspective uh, from an aerial standpoint this is the area where there's an open a little opening to a side yard uh, and you can see uh, the yellow Arrow, there's a, the picture on the next slide will show you that from the ground level, but the, uh, the shaded area in yellow is an area where uh, it has been problematic and it is adjacent to some near, nearby residences. Next slide. So here it is on the ground. There's a bit of an opening between a CMU wall and a, a fence covered with ivy. So the applicant has agreed to enclose this with either a gate or an extension of the fence or wall. Next slide. And then here, this is the trash area. So a couple of uh, issues with noise uh, in this area and you can also see that this is where the compactor and the, the dumpsters and the recycling bins are located. So collection in this area is in, in proximity to the residences behind as well. Next slide. So a little bit more on the store hours. Um, in not making a recommendation, uh, staff has just weighed the retail operation uh, and the impact of uh, deliveries and recycling being kind of the more intense impacts associated with this uh, as well. The, um, this, the property is located in a, a distinguished uh, commercial district, so it is appropriately located. Uh, but the actual activity of just a retail transaction, customers and vehicles coming and going um, was less impactful. And then you look across the city, it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of which stores are regulated with hours and which aren't. So Knob Hill and Lucky, to be New Leaf, have no hour regulations while Whole Foods and Trader Joe's do. Next slide, please. And then just uh, for clarification for the room uh, in terms of timing, so Grocery Outlet being the, the uh, applicant tonight is expecting to move in uh, end of the year, November, December. Um, and they're the ones that would hold the new liquor license, not new leaf. So any conditions associated with um, the result of, of the public hearing tonight would take effect when Grocery Outlet begins their operation. So it wouldn't be tomorrow when new leaf is there, but when Grocery Outlet opens for business. Next slide. And that concludes my summary. I believe the applicant is here uh, and may make a brief presentation or introduce themselves and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Oh, I have a question actually. Yeah. So um, I have a question. I just want to make certain that I understand this process because it's my understanding that New Leaf has a conditional use permit to operate a grocery store. And that conditional use permits go with the land, not the tenant that's in there. And so if Grocery Outlet wanted to come in and open up the grocery store uh, without selling hard liquor, uh, we wouldn't be here at all because they, they automatically have that original conditional use permit to operate a grocery store. That? Yeah, that's correct. 
Right. So whatever we do now, you know, as far as, you know, putting new conditions and things on them are really because the applicant has agreed to let us modify that part of the conditional use permit because clearly these things don't have anything to do with the. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from your staff? I guess I would like clarification on that. My understanding was that when they wanted to modify the conditional use permit to increase uh, the um, and to allow for liquor sales, hard liquor sales, that that opened the door for a complete review of the existing conditional use permit. So the operational conditions, you, you could look at operational conditions relative to the in intensification of the use. Could you repeat that? Can only look, yeah. So yeah, operational conditions. So if you think that the, as proposed, the 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 sales of liquor, um, you could add conditions to help mitigate any issues to offset the, the expanded use associated with the the liquor license. It has to be associated with the liquor portion of it. Okay. Yeah, I had a question um, regarding item number 17, regarding the trash compactor. Um, it was, I think, uh, eight to six, one, seven days a week. <clears throat> but the uh, other conditions are based on Monday through Friday. Was there a conversation around uh, the use of the trash compactor? I'm just thinking, like, especially on a Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. Yeah, it, so our recommendation just follows what, some other grocery stores have. Um, typically, use of a compactor is is a l uh, shorter duration than a delivery, so we did not put a date on that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Or we can open. I just okay. had that comment. Okay. Um, all right, so now we're going to open the public hearing. Would anybody like to speak to this project applicant? Yeah, come on up. And please enter your name. In, oh, uh, I will. <laughs> okay, when I get done here, I will. Okay, no problem. Um, good. I think your mic is off. Just the, the sound guy is, is giving me a signal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And speak into the microphone. Certainly. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize. Um, uh, just for the record, we do agree, uh, uh, concur with the staff recommendation for approval, and we do agree to all of the conditions of approval as presented to you this evening. Brian and I, when we started this process, uh, immediately talked about the area in the back, um, and putting a fence up there was very logical. We Rochelle at once, nobody back there. That, that doesn't benefit them at all. And we certainly understand the concerns about noise uh, with the um, trash pickup and, and uh, compactor. Um, the, we're agnostic to when they pick up the trash. Um, and it's kind of up to a hauler. I understand that they were picking up rather early. And um, to us, it doesn't make a difference what time they pick it up. So we, we're, you know, have no issues with the... Um, Conditions. We just hope that the hauler uh, will actually ab abide by those. And certainly if they don't, we'll, we'll, we're happy to say something and, and make sure that that's rectified as well. Um, for those of you that don't know much about uh, Grocery Outlet, uh, there are a couple. They have um, 280, 290 stores in California, 400 plus nationwide. Um, there's a store in Santa Cruz, a store in Watsonville. We're very excited to be here in the uh, town of uh, Capitola. Um, every community that we've opened up a store on, we've uh, gotten a very good uh, following immediately. We bring a very, very good um, merchandising uh, offering to a community. All of the stores in California do sell alcohol. This one we would like to inventory distilled spirits, uh, which is very standard for us, um, along with the wine. Uh, the display area is less than 10%. It, it's only about 7% of the um, and that includes the beer and wine, 7% of the overall floor area there. Um, 
So with that said, um, you know, we're, we're open for any, um, you know, questions that you may have. And um, last thing I wanted to touch on is that um, locally, um, well, it's a large corporation and there's many manage management levels. Locally, it is managed by an owner operator. Um, uh, owner, not exactly, but operator, meaning that the people that are managing the store are usually people that are uh, local to this particular area. And uh, they do participate in the success, uh, the financial success of the store, which is a little bit different than, say, a franchise model and so on and so forth. So you'll find that these people will be local. You'll find that they're at that store 12 plus hours each and every day. So they take a lot of pride in the store. And um, uh, I think you guys would be pleasantly surprised at how well the operation is running. Thank you. With that, I'm available for any questions. And Joe, I don't know if you had anything more to add, but. Hello, good evening, and I just wanted to thank the commission and, and staff for their hard work in, in reviewing our project. Uh, my name is Joe Tanner. I'm the entitlement improvement manager for, for Grocery Outlet, and we are very excited to be coming to, to Capitola in, uh, in the coming year, and we look forward with, to working with the community. And I was going to talk about the I.O. model, and, and uh, our consultant very elo eloquently explained that really the individual is part of the community, and a lot of times it's, it's very, very common that the store operator is part of the, the chamber or the rotary or some local community groups. Uh, so I think that if there are issues that may come up through the store's life, that the operator will be uh, very, very responsive and, and open to communicating with the city and, and the citizens as well, if, if anything should come up in the future. And of course, uh, my my phone is always on, and uh, Brian has my contact information. If any other uh, follow up questions come up or any concerns in, in the future that that may come up, I'm happy to to chat with uh, any one of you uh, about those. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak about this project? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Priba Garamoni. I'm a homeowner in Tradewind, senior manufacturer home park located at 4160 um, Jade Street. I'm here to speak on behalf of all the park residents that are affected by the location of the new leaf and soon to be grocery outlet store on uh, 41st Avenue. First, let me say that we appreciate the inclusion of the conditions in the permit modification request review. Thank you so much for um, addressing these concerns. However, several more significant concerns remain. First, the hours of operation. Currently, the New Leaf store operates daily from 8 a.m to 9 p.m. In the 1990s, park residents contacted the city and made significant effort to ensure that these reasonable hours were maintained. Allowing any extended hours of operation would result in substantial noise at times where nearby residents are trying to sleep. The residents are in their 70s to 90s and this will adversely affect their health. Second, the location of where delivery trucks idle needs to be limited to areas away from the back wall, separating the store from the homes. The idling trucks cause excessive exhaust fumes to carry over the wall and enter into homes. This problem is currently causing some residents harm and forcing the closure of windows at all hours during the heat. Finally, the issue of outside refrigerators should be addressed and included as a condition of approval. All such equipment should be inside the store and not located outside. Such equipment creates substantial noise 
24 hours a day. Again, on behalf of the park residents, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arlen Osborne. I'm also a resident there. I do, my property does not back onto New Leaf, but when, uh, and, and I'm just taking the opportunity since the, the new management and stuff is here, the, the consultants, to mention one other item, which is that when New Leafs and the surrounding area leave their dumpsters open, as soon as it gets light, we have flocks of seagulls coming in that make a raucous sound for quite a long time. And they're all on our roofs, they're everywhere. I love seagulls, I love living here. I actually love Grocery Outlet. I've been shopping there for years. Um, but I just wanted them to have this awareness that if they could close their dumpsters, that would help. We also sometimes struggle with rat problems. So that would be an important good neighbor kind of policy. I know it's probably not in what the purview of what you're dealing with, but since we have this opportunity, I want to mention it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak to this project? Okay, hearing none, we're going to close the public hearing and bring it back to for submission deliberation. Would anybody like to start us off? Well, do we want to go through three, four, the four items one by one? Well, I've listed them just in case we we did. Um, I, well, I uh, I'll be happy to start if you like. Um, so, uh, with regarding the uh, the hours, when I brought this up to Brian, when I was asking about this issue and trying to get an understanding of what this application was all about, uh, he pointed out, and I uh, and I tend to agree that the the extended hours is isn't going to affect the noise as much because it's it, we're just talking about people coming in and out the front doors, and um, and, and so. I don't, you know, I, I want to encourage businesses to come to Capitol and I want to encourage them to follow their standard business model that's successful. So um, I think it's reasonable for them to have the extended hours. The The notion of the idle um, trucks okay. and the exhaust, I don't know to what extent, we didn't talk about that. I don't know to what extent that can be mitigated, but I'd be interested in hearing what it, what conversations you might have had on that. So there are some air quality standards as well. Um, I didn't wasn't able to look into that thoroughly, but the the commission could add some clarification language. The language that we have in here is that delivery vehicles will not stand idle outside of delivery hours. So if they arrived a, a little bit early, they can't just sit there idling. So the, there's an attempt to address that uh, issue then. Okay. Um, with regards to the outside re refrigeration, that, that sounds like a major redesign to their, their building structure, to what extent they can have proper cooling. I, I don't know. That's it. That's, I, I'd be re reluctant to impose something like that because it sounds like it's a, it, it might be very difficult to implement. Um, and the dumpsters, dumpsters opening, I think that's the issue with green waste more so than uh, this applicant. So those are my thoughts, but I'm willing to listen to other arguments. Okay. Well, I will go next. Um, I actually agree with you on the hours as far as customers coming to the store and going in. I personally go to Knob Hill often at 7 o'clock in the morning because my day's real busy and... Um, you know, simply going and parking in front of the store and going in and out, you know, I don't think I create a, a noise problem. I do think it's I do think it's important to regulate the things like, you know, the hours the trash compactors are going to work, the hours the deliveries are going to be made, you know, the things that, that do generate noise. Um, uh, I think it's important that, um, you know, the trucks not come in idle 
um, for an extended period of time. I know that when refrigeration trucks come and they're making delivery, they need to keep the truck running to keep the refrigeration going. Um, but I certainly hope that, um, you know, the grocery store manager um, uh, will not have the trucks coming outside of the hours that they can come to make deliveries and, um, you know, work with them to make certain that the truck is not sitting there for several hours waiting to complete the delivery. Um, and I think that's, that's something that we can work with the grocery store operators on. Uh, and I've seen grocery store operators do that and work with, with the people who make deliveries to them. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, there, there is a conditional use permit for this grocery store to operate. So I appreciate all of the new conditions that the new applicants been willing to agree to, to, you know, help the neighbors next door because you are right next door to, you know, this commercial area. And I recognize that, you know, there are problems as a result of that. Um, but, you know, to ask them to, you know, relocate their equipment, I think is, is really beyond what we can do uh, because they want to sell hard alcohol. We have to make some nexus with what they're asking for, for us to require them to to make some sort of change. Um, it's not like there was never a grocery, you know, the grocery store wasn't there before. Uh, and the dumpster, I certainly think that uh, any reasonable grocery operator can make certain that their dumpsters are closed. And um, I wouldn't hesitate at all if you notice the dumpsters are open to call the grocery store. And if the grocery store doesn't respond, you certainly can call uh, City Hall and staff, and they will call the management of the grocery store because, you know, that's just common courtesy to, to do that and be next door to the neighbors. So those are sort of my thoughts on those four items. So you mentioned the 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 exhaust and how the the, the trucks could you could negotiate deliveries. Is there a condition maybe that we could? Well, I think that we have a condition regarding the hours yeah. that the trucks can come and make deliveries. Um, I I don't think that we can add um, you know a condition on how long the truck can actually be there. It would be. And if, you know, two trucks arrive at the same time, who gets to unload first because the other guys, you know, uh, so. Uh, there are defined hours of delivery, correct? Yes. Can you go over what those hours are again for us, Brian, so everyone's aware? Yeah, so 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday, and delivery vehicles should not be permitted to idle during non-delivery hours. Um, so just a clarification, uh, there is not new equipment being installed, refrigeration equipment, is that correct? Uh, there is some, there's, so there's a tenant improvement and there are some new rooftop equipment and there was actually uh, an extension of the rooftop equipment screen to, to screen that some of the new equipment. And that was processed a few months ago under a minor design permit, so it didn't require planning commission review. Okay. Um, just going back to the public comment just about the noise of the equipment. So that equipment would have been installed under a permit and then there's SEER ratings and uh, stuff like that that was followed for that equipment. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. So nothing new is being added. You know, no new equipment is being added because of what the new, this change in condition is. No. Thank you. I don't have too much to add except for I, I agree with what Commissioner Westman was saying with the, our, our limited parameters are, we've, I feel we have a privilege to kind of to comment on the rest of it, but um, we should stick to the alcohol um, distilled spirits principle. But does, do we have a motion or 
I'll, I'll make a motion to um, approve application 240154 uh, for a modification of the conditional use permit uh, for the off-site sale of <coughs> distilled spirits um, with all of the staff recommendations included. Um, I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Vice Chair Jensen? Aye. Chair Christensen? Aye. Okay, passes. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you. Great. Right. Moving on to item B is 709 Riverview Drive. Do we have a staff report? Excuse me, Madam oh. Chair. Um, I'm going to take the advice of the Community Development Director and recuse myself from this item. Okay, thank you, Peter. All right. Yeah, well, we have a, I'll have the presentation on this, um, but it's, it's at the end of the prior slideshow. If you could pull that up, please. Just a continuation of the same slide deck. Oh, gotcha. Okay. The second. <laughs> All right, thank you. We're ready. I'll go ahead and get started. So, uh, 709 Riverview Drive, uh, we've got a request to remove an 85 inch Monterey Cypress tree with a future development. And just real quick on the aerial photo here, uh, you can see the star is the existing building um, built in the 1950s. That's about a thousand square foot single story residence. Uh, and then you can see the tree to the, to the left of it. There's a very large tree with about a 60 inch canopy in the rear yard. Next slide, please. So uh, the proposal from the applicant uh, is really to get an early read on tree removal uh, with an anticipated future new residence um, with the concern that uh, going to the expense and effort of a full design without a read on this tree uh, could be a, could be a waste of, of time and resources and so that's really what um, what their motivation is this evening is to get a, a read from the Planning Commission on the status of this tree prior to preparation of plans. Next slide, please. So here is a street view uh, of the existing residence, and there's the tree in the in the back. You can see it pretty prominently there. Next slide, please. The applicant did have an arborist report prepared. Uh, there were some minor pruning and uh, trimming recommendations to improve the overall health of the tree, but the status of the tree is that it is in fair to good health. Next slide, please. And then here's another photo. So multi, multi stems coming off of a base trunk uh, for an 85 inch tree. Next slide. And then this is a conceptual site plan. So uh, just to give you a lay of the land, the property is a little over 5,300 square feet. It's got an FAR of a little over 2,600 square feet. And then the orange is the existing building footprint. And then I've got an animation if you click the next. Highlighted in purple there is their anticipated building footprint, and you can see that it, it covers a, quite a bit of the critical root zone. That's the, the area underneath the canopy and then into uh, portions of the trunk. So the anticipation is this tree would be need to be removed with a house taking uh, this footprint. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about the city's processes. So there's two processes for tree removal. One is a standalone tree removal permit. And so this is without uh, being in the, in the same stride as uh, a development project. And so the city has findings that need to be made in order to approve a tree removal. And they center on damaging uh, structures, unreasonable damage to, to private or public structures, immediate danger, or health considerations like the tree is dead, diseased, or dying. 
Uh, so there's a pretty tight set of criteria for independent tree removal. And then the second process is tree removal in conjunction with development, which is uh, a little bit more, affords a little more authority to the Planning Commission, uh, which has full authority and discretion over uh, tree removal for development. And the Commission can consider other factors like canopy coverage or lifespan of the tree, useful life of structures, alternatives, better overall outcomes, arboricultural practices, et cetera. Next slide. So most of this is in your staff report, but some of the considerations that, uh, that we wanted to put forward is the tree is certainly a very large specimen, canopy spread of 60 feet, 75 feet tall. I showed you a, uh, an estimate of the drip line of the tree. Uh, then we took a look at the buildable area or the buildable envelope. So that's the lot area excluding the setback area, like where actually a building footprint could com be compliant. And that's about half of the property uh, at 2,695 square feet. The critical root zone covers about 1,100 square feet of that space, so 41% of the buildable area. The point of those two facts is really any kind of uh, development is going to have to deal with the tree and would require some significant effort uh, to design around the tree, jog around the tree, um, minimal impact type of foundations, maybe be a, a two-story home. Uh, another one is that the tree is past its midpoint in its lifespan. Uh, it's likely that a, a new building would have a, a useful life longer than the remaining lifespan of the tree. Uh, removal would also uh, reduce canopy coverage from 51% to 9%, so in uh, the same um, movement as a new development, uh, the applicant would need to propose to get the canopy coverage back up to 15%, which is the city's goal. Uh, and then uh, quoting the code here, so new residential development uh, shall be cited and designed to minimize cutting of trees. So um, without having a full application, we haven't really explored all the alternatives, but the code advises us to explore alternatives. Uh, and then procedurally, an approval now would also potentially redu reduce pur purview of a future planning commission while reviewing a, a complete application. Next slide, please. So we are recommending uh, denial of this application, uh, but we've also included an alternative if the commission concludes that removal is warranted. And so there's a couple of timing conditions uh, and mitigation conditions. So uh, we would want this, the, the actual removal of the trees to be tied to uh, this future design permit and not to remove the tree in the interim. Uh, and then the second would be replacement of two to one with 24 inch box and then a landscape plan showing the achievement of the 15% canopy coverage goal. Next slide. So we, again, recommending denial. Uh, the denial would not preclude the applicant from proposing tree removal with their future design permit. So with that, I'm, I believe the applicant is here and also wants to make a presentation, but I'm happy to take questions. Any questions? Um, I'm going to open up the public hearing. It is the applicant. Uh, thank you, Council, for hearing from me tonight. Um, I'm the owner at 709 Riverview Drive. And um, just give you a little history of uh, <clears throat> me and this tree. I did submit to have the tree removal, to have the tree removed uh, with the tree removal permit. And uh, as Brian said, Brian did a great job. Uh, it was denied. I was hoping to get that approved because I do see the tree as being a hazard to both um, my house in my neighbor's house uh, and I believe that it's large enough that it would not only cause damage to the structures themselves but potentially to uh, people inside of them. Um, so I was told I could uh, appeal to the Planning Commission and I'm hoping that um, I can get the approval because as Brian said I, I don't want to spend a lot of time and money uh, going through the process of drawing up plans that uh, and submitting those for approval only to have it denied. Um, so I guess just a couple other comments. Um, 
One is that I've worked with other municipalities and those typically have a provision in them uh, to remove trees that are in the way and not just in poor health. And so um, that's something that typically is done uh, in other municipalities. The other, another thing is that um, the, time, the best time to remove this tree is going to be between the point that I demo the existing structure and I build the new structure. So um, if I build a new structure and I build it around that tree, if it were to come over, um, it would most likely, um, you know, it can, only, it can only fall in one of four sides and three of those would have structure. So it would, it would be a great risk to either my house or my neighbor's house. Um, and then finally, um, it was told to me that there, are, there have been projects that the city of Capitola has um, their own building projects where they have removed trees that were in good health. So I guess I'm appealing to the Planning Commission to um, essentially just apply um, you know, their standards equally between their own projects and projects uh, taken on by uh, private citizens. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? This project. Good evening. I'm Mario Beltramo. I happen to be the owner of the property immediately next door at 705 Riverview. My wife, Linda, and I have owned the property for 24 years. When we bought the property in 2000, the tree was large. Since then, and due to, I think, the previous owner's inability or um, disregard for, 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 for proper trimming practices, the tree has just grown exponentially. And as you can see, as Brian pointed out, although I'm not sure, frankly, that the pictures that we've seen do justice to just how enormous the tree has become. So over the years, it's gotten closer and closer and closer to our property at 705, to such extent that now a significant portion of the tree is literally over the roof of our house. And I'm concerned about that, and I've, I've told Brad about this. I, I, I'm concerned about this, not just for the safety of myself and my wife. We're in our 70s, you know, if we die, yeah. We've only got about a 10-year life expectancy at most. <laughs> but I'm more concerned with the life expectancy of my 12 grandkids who are over the house all the time. And they're staying in our bedroom where they sleep over. They love to do that. And literally, at night, we can hear uh, squirrels. I hope they're squirrels jumping from the tree to our, to our roof. And we have seen the limbs fall. Despite it being healthy, in, in storms, limbs have fallen, and frankly, thanks to the Lord, they haven't yet come down on the house. They've fallen only on the fence, but they're becoming precariously damaged uh, in such condition now that we have seen them break and almost almost uh, fall, and we've had to, we've had to call uh, tree trimmers to come and remove the tree. And I'm worried that if this tree is not removed very soon, a calamity is going to befall one of us, Brad's family, my family, or the family on the other side. And so I'm, I'm very much a, an advocate for the applicant's right to remove this tree. I think it would be in the best interest of safety and the best interest of the community, and certainly would... I can't imagine anybody being able to build with that existing tree the way it is right now, no matter what size house you put on it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak? Good evening, honorable members of the Planning Commission. Um, can we bring a slide back up? Can you sh bring the canopy of that, of that, uh, or, or 
the overhead shot of that that lot there with the with the tree. Um, if you, that's fine, but uh, the, the overheads I was looking at, just to, I'd like you to take a look at the size of the canopy on that. And um, I, I'm the designer on the project, and the canopy covers at least 50% of the whole lot. Um, it, uh, and then another, probably another 20% onto the neighbor's property there, okay? The, the size of the tree. Um, there, there's some contradictions in the building process today, and one of them is that fire departments want you to keep um, a hundred foot separation from homes uh, for for fire safety today, and they make that a condition of when you buy. Well, that doesn't work very well in Capitola because uh, a, a, a defensible space is mostly what you get. This could never be a defensible space from this tree. Um, if if you know that corridor right there, it's heavily vegetated it's never it's never pruned or anything is taken out of that area unless it maybe it's in front of a house um but that that whole creek corridor is is a, is a fire hazard itself and 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 uh, central fire will will, will will verify that and they even looked at the possibility of of um uh, what would happen if a fire ran up that creek well, this is another. This is another. This is half the point. The other point I'm going to bring out is is that is that it's nearly impossible to design around the, the canopy. And if I you were asked to build, I can because it's not out of the canopy now. We have a we have 1,100 square foot house there, um, uh, much smaller than than most houses that are in that corridor there. But what what it gives us an opportunity to do is if we remove it. We'll, we will be planting two to three trees, what's required to us along the edge of the corridor, which which makes sense to to the vegetation that's there. Number one. Number two is 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 that it gives us enough room to build a, a house that is comparable in size to the neighborhood and still be protect, protected protected from from fire danger. Now the third figure is this is if you look at the overhead picture on this, it's in it's in the south. Um, west uh, 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 corner of the property. What does that mean? It means that there'll never be any sun on this house. I'm serious. Look at the thickness of that canopy. They will never see the sun. Afternoon, so, we, you know, so being able to remove it at this point and make that decision, um, it, it has a lot of justification. And, and, and the main thing is, is that they can build a house there and they can also replant along the corridor, which will, will will be good for the corridor. But at the same time, it makes this house much more usable. I think it's a lot. Is up. Thank you very much, Mr. Norton. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Okay, hearing none. Um, we're closing the public hearing, and we're going to bring it back to commission deliberation. Susan, I'm 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 willing to start. Um, you know, I, I think trees are, are, are always sort of a, a, a difficult issue, but um, trees have always been important to Capitola and Capitola's community. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons that we have a significant tree ordinance. And uh, over the years, I think the city's been quite reasonable um, if there was a case made that, you know, a tree absolutely uh, needed to be removed for safety reasons or the tree was in poor health. Um, we haven't ever, you know, in, as far as my memory goes, had someone come in and say, you know, I want to cut down the tree because I don't want to go to the expense of coming up with plans and designing with the tree there. And we state quite clearly in, in our tree ordinance in 1212-130 um, that any new uh, residential development should be designed around, um, you know, existing and major trees. Um, 
And uh, we have an Arbor's report which says, you know, the tree's in quite good health. Uh, the tree certainly could be, um, have a major pruning and cleaning out, which would, you know, eliminate some of the concerns of it. And, um, um, you know, I've seen us grant variances for people so they could save trees on their property. You know, I've seen people do special foundations so they could save trees on their property. So um, uh, for me, uh, I, I don't think I can go to the point of starting to set the precedent of, you know, we're going to take out a he perfectly healthy tree um, um, now, just because, you know, the applicant doesn't want to have the burden of trying to figure out how to design around, around the tree. Um, I personally went up and looked at the tree. You know, I know how big it is. I, I know what an impact it has. You know, it also uh, is a magnificent tree in that neighborhood and, and, and certainly an asset. You know, we all talk about global warming and trees and stuff, but, you know, this one just has to be inconvenient, so it should go. Um, so for me, um, you know, at this point, I couldn't approve uh, a tree removal permit to take it out. Um, uh, as the staff said, it doesn't mean that the applicant can't apply for that when, you know, he presents a design to the city um, to go forward with build, building a residential unit. Um, but to take it out before we even have an application for a house uh, sort of seems to me that we're putting the cart before the horse. Um, and um, as, as I said, I've seen this commission be quite reasonable, you know, on development applications, but um, I just can't come up with the findings to take out, out the tree at this point. Uh, the armrest report was from the applicant, is that correct? Yeah, the applicant, directly. And so there was one armrest report that came back that said the tree was in healthy condition but needed trimming, is that correct? Right. And then um, at the same time when we're talking about proposed development, is there, I mean, with the applicant, was there any proposed timeline for development um, laid out or was it just in the future? Uh, it was just... In the future, I think near future, applicant didn't say a, a specific time of expected submittal. I think um, they wanted to get to this hearing before they entered a contract for the full design. And so understanding that would be, uh, you look at, uh, I'm just trying to play this out in my mind. If we said, um, if this planning commission said, yeah, it could come out, the tree could be removed, uh, w for the future of taking out a, a, for a proposed project, but that'd be kind of circumventing the, the next uh, planning commission and looking at the project on what that design would be around a tree that maybe we put conditions on that tree being removed. I'm just kind of looking and trying not to circumvent the the will of the next uh, planning commission. You know, I don't think we should be making motions for conditions for in the future. So I was just wondering. I'm just trying to talk that out through myself. Can you add on to that or am I correct? Yeah, I, I think that's really probably at the core of where our recommendation lies is that we haven't seen the design, we haven't seen any play out of how alternatives could be designed around the tree or what other mitigations may be pruning the tree. Um, so that's part of it. And the other part of it is um, a decision tonight to approve would take a piece of a future approval away from a future planning commission without seeing a full project. Okay, I don't have any questions at this time. Um, it sounds to me that they're, the applicant's trying to um, gain peace of mind for the future endeavor of, of assembling an application and assembling a design, because he wants to know you know, if, if it's going to be an issue in the future, then why would he go to the, you know, to the trouble of designing a home if he couldn't ultimately take out the tree? Um, I see the, um, how, if we are taking away uh, a, a bit of um, the decision in the, for the future commission, 
to decide on that. Um, I, it's a hard, it's, a, it's kind of a toss up for me because I feel like you could, you can um, give this person this peace of mind, it's their property, but then also, um, you know, taking away that piece for the future commission decision seems it, it's a valid point. So I'm on yeah. the fence. I, I you know, our, our policy and our practice has always been that someone comes in with, yeah. with their plan. A full application. And, um, you know, uh, they could take out the tree. Um, I hate to say this, this applicant could get run over by a car and, you know, things could, nev could never go on that way. So I think, I think for us to have, you know, peace of mind to grant a uh, permit to take out what, what is really a magnificent tree um, you know, we, we need to have an application. That's how our process works. And, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that, um, you know, the Planning Commission might, you know, they, as I said before, I think they have been quite reasonable, my experience in the past and, and these kinds of circumstances. But I just think it sort of messes up the whole process. Um, uh, I, you know, we all would want um, to, we'd want to know that our project is going to get approved before we spent the money on designing a house, um, you know, but it doesn't really work that way. Um, and I think this would be a bad precedent for the city. Um, I think we need a project. I think we need a design. I think somebody thoughtfully needs to look at how much this tree can be pruned, you know, demonstrate to us, you know, that that's not going to work. Um, and as I said, you know, I mean, we've gone so far as to grant variances, you know, to people so they could save trees that we felt were important for a neighborhood. So it's just too early for me to give some, to approve a tree removal permit at this time you know, on this particular tree. I mean, the Argus report said the tree wasn't dangerous. It needs a little work. Um, so um, uh, um, I, I think, you know, we need a lot more information before we, we approve this kind of application. Um, one question I have is that if we did go with your alternative, um, would it, that the tree removal wouldn't take place until there was an application, and is that what I heard? Yeah. So if you if you do take the alternative, there's a couple of conditions in there that would tie it to uh, becoming effective with a future design design permit approval. With the new development, so the timing would push to that approval. Okay. So you want me to make the motion? You want to talk about it? <laughs> it's only three of us. I think I can talk one more time. Okay. <laughs> Um, just uh, regarding the comment around city projects, are we aware of any city projects that we've removed trees to a pro pro uh, projected that we might do a project in the city in the future? I think what gets referred to, because I've heard that comment before, was the removal of the tree here at City Hall. And if anyone had been around and seen the damage that that tree was doing to the sidewalks, the foundation of the police department, that tree would have gotten a permit if it had been on private property or anyone else's house. I think you only need to look at the walkway the city's trying to build going out of the Upper Pacific Cove Mobile Home Park and the extremes that have gone in that design to try and not eliminate, you know, take out you know, the, the trees that go along that way. So as far as I know, I, I don't think the city has, you know, ever issued a permit for somebody to take out a tree based on something that somebody thought they were going to do in the future. Um, I think the Canary Island trees that were taken out by the wharf were taken out again because the sidewalk was being damaged. Um, and some people like to say, oh, no, well, they just came out because someone slipped on some pine needles. But there was a factual basis. And, and I, th I think the city has been thoughtful in issuing tree permits. And I, I think we've, uh, so far, 
uh, you know, done a pretty good job. If there's a safety hazard, if the tree, you know, there's something wrong, then those permits have, have been approved. Yeah. It's just to... I've seen them in other applications when they're proposing a home. They, they you know, make, a, make findings for removing large trees yeah. within that application right. context. I mean, we approved an application tonight up on Escalona where there is a major tree where the canopy is going to go over a major portion of the house. You know, and they work to design around it to save the tree. And um, I, I'm again, I'm not saying that the tree can't come out yeah. if there are plans and reasons to do that. I just think this is an inappropriate process. So I I will make a motion to deny uh, application 240351, the tree removal permit. Um, at uh, I think it's. Forgotten the address now, 709 Riverview Drive. I'll second. Roll call. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Vice Chair Jensen? Aye. Chair Christensen? Aye. Motion is denied. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item C. Citywide zoning code update. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I forgot about Peter. <laughs> Getting cool outside. <laughs> All right. Good evening, commissioners, Chair Christensen. Uh, next slide, please. We have the ninth session of our twenty twenty four collectively referred to as zoning update. Um, and perhaps the, the final one for this year at, at Planning Commission. Next slide, please. Um, so we'll be covering a bit of the background and from the last meeting as well as some of the proposed design amendments uh, that were partially introduced last meeting and, and are here today, as well as the staff recommendation uh, for an approval and op alternative options as well. So on September 19th, as you recall, the Planning Commission adopted a resolution recommending approval by City Council of the majority of the zoning amendments and code amendments and map uh, amendment removing the overlay. Uh, however, the chapters relating to design review were explicitly pulled from that uh, resolution. Uh, for further discussion tonight, the Planning Commission also requested a bit more information on, on comparing how the design review updates uh, in pro process compared between the old code, which we sometimes refer to as Arkansas, the current code, as well as the proposed amendments tonight. Um, and I just wanted to provide a reminder, mainly for anyone listening, that the amendments that had been introduced back uh, officially in, in August for multifamily zoning, as well as the capital and mall incentives that, that weren't introduced but um, were intended to be, are not going to be reviewed until 2025. We still occasionally get inquiries about that, so just wanted to make that clear to the public that those are not on this calendar year's agenda. Next slide, please. So, uh, Anna. High level, the changes to the existing code include the requirement for a public notice of submitted application to be posted on the project site, as well as expanding the types of projects that would require a design professional review and involvement, uh, loosely involving the, the majority of single family uh, projects, as well as additions to multifamily projects uh, and non-residential as well. 
Next slide, please. So we, we further broke down some of the tables that were already included in the staff report and expanded on, on it a bit as well. This one here is, is just who participates in the design review process. That's the lead up to planning commission review. And under the Arkansas version of the code, the prior code, as well as the, the current and, and future, staff is, has always been a component in that review. However, under the old code, uh, all applications had a design professional or architect involved in the review, regardless of the project type. If it required a design permit, it required the architect at the Arkansas meetings to be involved. Under the existing code, uh, as you know, we, we had the uh, dissolution of the Arkansas committee, and, and now it's typically just reviewed by staff with exception to a number of, of project subset types. Um, in which case those are reviewed by a design professional. And under the proposed code, that same format exists. However, it, it would likely uh, have a substantial increase in the types of projects and the number of projects that now have design professional involvement. Next slide, please. Um, so expanding on, on when, those, uh, when their participation is a part of the design review, here we have just a breakdown of the single family projects, multifamily mixed use and non-residential. Again, under the prior code, all projects had that, that component. Under the existing code, as you can see, it did not involve single family projects. As, and for other projects, it was, uh, it was uh, related to new structures. Under the proposed code that we have tonight, it again includes notably single family projects upper story additions and new single family homes, as well as additions, new upper floor additions to uh, mixed use multifamily and, uh, and other uh, broader additions to uh, non-residential. Next slide, please. And we added this to, to try to better conceptualize how this process will be slightly different between the different types of projects because under single family review, it is going to be a, a lower process. So starting at the prior code, um, we had an architect's involvement at the Arkansas committee and they provided verbal feedback to, to the staff and applicants and that was for all projects. Under existing code, again, we don't have a formal Arkansas committee anymore. Uh, and a design professional, when they are required for multifamily non-residential projects, they prepare a more robust and formal written report that's given to staff and the applicant. And so that, that runs as a, a complement to staff's review. Under the proposed code, we have a bit of an amalgamation of those two processes where for single family projects, you would see something similar to our site where they're, they're receiving a city and, and the applicant are receiving verbal feedback from a design professional and under the multifamily and non-residential projects they would we'd continue to have that more robust written report preparation next slide please and it, it can be difficult to try to uh, quantify exact timing or even a range and even if we did the, the margins in between how they would differ here might not provide a, uh, a useful metric for the planning commission however on a higher level looking at what might take longer what might take less time uh, we have in in green um, the projects where you have an architect or design professional sitting in on a meeting or uh, in being involved directly with the staff and the applicant providing verbal feedback is typically an, an easier process to facilitate as opposed to the two in yellow where you actually have that consultant providing a written report and which among other things that takes uh, more time for them to, to uh, finish as well as getting them to um, have earlier lead time on their review rather than uh, like with Arkansas, they might have received a package of materials a week or less before a meeting and then been, were giving more topical advice. So just on a higher level, the 
the verbal feedback format would likely be a little less time consuming. Next slide, please. So regarding public notice and Brown Act and, and meeting requirements under the old code, the Arkansas Committee was a legislative established sitting body that was subject to the Brown Act. We also had that uh, posting requirements for those meetings under the existing code uh, with intention that that Arkansas Committee was dissolved and the review process no longer required the Brown Act uh, stipulations. And under the proposed code, it has been subsequently revised so that we aren't creating a, a body that would be subject to the Brown Act. So under the existing code and the proposed code, neither of them would be subject to the Brown Act. However, in addition to the proposed code is the introduction of that public notice of submitted application where an applicant would need to post this, their site shortly after submitting an application and, and, and have that verified. So that, that's something new and wasn't done in, in the Arkansas uh, timeline. Next slide, please. It's a little cut off there, but uh, on this one, we just have some uh, breakdowns of cost estimates. Under the prior code, it was a stipend based where the city paid a stipend to, to uh, contracted ar architects that worked on it, typically $50 a meeting. Um, under the existing code, we, we go by a contract basis that is uh, tied to a project. The estimates you see up there are within the range of some of the recent projects we've seen um, where we've had that, their involvement. And that is a direct applicant cost. And under the proposed code, and here we, we would have a uh, combination of approaches whereby the lesser, uh, less rigorous review for single family projects, you'd be looking at a, more of a stipend model. And then we would continue the, the upper direct applicant cost for sing, uh, multifamily and commercial projects. Next slide, please. And we wanted to know, it looks like we, we have them here tonight, but we did receive a public comment from EMB with some concerns regarding the design review amendments uh, tied to uh, timeline and process and, and, and objectivity, uh, as well as uh, comments about or suggested language changes and additions to the density bonus amendments that would further reference compliance with the city's local coastal program. Staff is not recommending that we incorporate that suggested language to the density bonus because our, our chapter 1803 is not actually in our LCP. So it is already in there by reference, um, but we find that sufficient. Next slide, please. Next steps, we have uh, the top two meetings, city council tentative dates for where the zoning update could go before them, um, provided we have a, a holistic resolution tonight. We want to note that although there are two additional meetings after those, that for scheduling purposes and requirements for us to have uh, this material posted a certain amount of time ahead of it having readings, um, if the Planning Commission did not have a resolution to move this forward tonight, we would need them to have this item continue to a special meeting, uh, likely October 17th, in order for this to be feasible. Otherwise, it, it would put us within, a, within no margin. Next slide, please. So with that, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission adopt a resolution that would recommend both the design review amendments as well as the density bonus uh, modifications and uh, for approval by city council. Uh, and we're noting that the density bonus, uh, unlike the design review amendments, is something that we are required to accomplish before the end of the year. Next slide, please. That said, there are a number of options the Planning Commission could elect to take tonight. First one being the positive recommendation, as we discussed a moment ago, to City Council. 
uh, alternatively a positive recommendation with uh, with modifications or a positive recommendation for the density bonus only and um, presumably to bring up the design review discussion at at the following year or to have have this uh, item in whole continued to a future date and again if that is the case we are recommending strongly that it be to October 17th so that we can make this work next slide please that's it all right thank you With that we're here and available for questions and I did want to um, just report that uh, Commissioner SD reached out and is obviously unable to attend tonight he did make a, a statement in his email that he supports the proposed amendments to the zoning code related to the design review process. And then he specified the exact code references. Um, and he also said, however, he will let his colleagues on planning commission make changes if necessary. He'll support that as well. So um, that's it. I don't have more than that, but he apologized for not being able to attend. Thank you. Do you have any questions for staff? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, so one thing, just to bring back the highlight. Um, so on single family homes, um, this would be uh, reviewed during the same time as staff is already reviewing projects on the same timeline. This wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, an additional meeting, right? It would just be in conjunction at the same time. So it would, yeah. To in short, it would likely fall into place with the existing review process we have now where we will have an initial review of a project for completeness and compliance, issue a letter, and then schedule a time where we can meet with that applicant and, and get some, some more uh, direct uh, input to them by planning and the other uh, relevant departments. So that's where the um, that verbal input from a design professional would come in uh, for single family projects is they would be involved in that conversation. And at that stage, if there was like um, a comment made by the design professional, that would, the, it would be a suggested item, is that correct? I mean, it would be a suggested item that the applicant can take or not take. Yeah, uh, for the most part, and this is in our, our, our code draft that the, the input on, on these bodies is, unless it's tied to a completeness or compliance item, so unless it's tied to a specific standard in our code, that these are advisory inputs and they can choose to act on them or not. Sometimes when, and that, and that is reflects today's process as well, where we will make, we'll either ask questions or, or provide recommendations on what we think may improve the design or limit some impacts to their surroundings. And sometimes depending on the nature of, of those recommendations, if they elect not to take them up, we sometimes continue that recommendation on to the Planning Commission where the Planning Commission has a little more discretion to require it regardless of what the specific standard in the code is. So yes, uh, it would fit into that process and yes, it, it is advisory in nature. And then um, regarding uh, cost, so on a, family, on a single family home, there'd be no cost to the applicant other than the cost of the proposed sign for proposed development, is that correct? And the city would be picking up like the stipend costs, if you want to call it? Yes, as, as far as an application received today or an application received on this, this co-taking effect, these changes would not change the amount of, of fees owed if someone were submitting at either time frame. So the stipend would be a cost by the city and um, if they have material costs that's not factored into our fees. Okay. And really the fee then is only on um, multifamily, correct? It, it, everything else, multifamily or non-residential. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, in place now, correct? Yes, to a, a lesser extent. It doesn't affect as many uh, subsets of those projects, but yes. Uh, and when we talk about existing code, as your, the existing code from what date? Was that uh, 22? Today. I mean, are you asking when it was adopted? Uh, yeah, when was it adopted? It was adopted in 2018, and then it was certified by the Coastal Commission in 2021. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, 
I think it's just important to like, uh, I was trying to try and reflect on this issue and see how we got, you know, how we got there and what we're trying, I think, as commissioners, and I'll speak for myself, um, you know, we, we, a lot of projects are coming to the commission, um, and it seems like um, communication to our community maybe um, hasn't been the best or it can be improved. Um, so I think we talked about, you know, we've had, and these are just comments I don't say they're valid or, or been um, substantiated, um, but, you know, we, I didn't get a green card. Um, you know, it's only 300 feet, and, you know, I'm at 302 feet, and I didn't get a green card. And so I think um, the staff has taken upon yourself to look at some other projects and stand in 300 to 500 feet. Um, and I think the goal was that, um, I know one thing I brought up was about a sign in front of the project to kind of have that be um, another way of noticing the community about projects that are going on. Um, and, and there seems like there's con concerns and questions about the whole process and everything. And then I started thinking about, you know, when we had the room filled, like, I think, what, a month ago with many people, um, when the, the green card went out and the little green notice um, went up about zoning changes and stuff, and it seemed like there was a big community. Um, let's just say the community was excited about the potential changes in their neighborhood. Um, and I was trying to see, you know, as we're trying to bring the community along and as we're doing this development, at the same time, would it be a good idea to maybe take this issue and maybe reach back out to our community a little bit more when we're doing that zoning code update and looking at um, that outreach of probably will be made will probably be a lot more extensive than what we've heard here um, in the last couple of meetings. And also there'll probably be more design professionals, architects involved, uh, can I think as zoning is going to change across the community. Um, we might get a better flavor of does this work or how can this even proposed thing be enhanced. So I just wanted to throw that out to our commissioners to see maybe for some deliberation or thought around those two things. And um, I appreciate you clarifying about the cost and the timing um, on what the proposed um, change might be. So thank you. Thank you. So I just have a procedural question. So as far as our housing element is concerned, um, at this point in time, you know, we, we need to move forward with this so that um, uh, we can comply with what the state needs us to do in 2024. But as far as the changes to the design review um, uh, ordinance, none of that needs to happen in 2024, right? That's not on our work schedule for this year. That is correct. So um, to move forward, really the only thing we need to deal with is the density bonus. And um, it wouldn't impact the housing element if we decided to delay uh, making any changes to the uh, design review process tonight. Uh, because, okay. So your option three, um, which is to make no changes um, other than to the density bonus, um, <clears throat> there was a, a lot of discussion of this in May, and a lot of the, the issues involved, as Commissioner Jensen pointed out, the noticing. And there was this, uh, Ben Noble said, yeah, they do some things in Berkeley that involve better noticing and whatnot. So is, is your option three including better noticing, that kind of thing? No, um, option three would be uh, to move forward with the density bonus only. And I think it said, and just not make a motion, no recommendation on the changes to the design permit. So we would revisit that in 2025. And um, if there's different planning commissioners, it'd be up to the planning commission whether or not they'd like to revisit that item as well so oh, that's the risk so I have I have one more question so um, there is nowhere that I could find that it says because right now applicants have to put up a notice if they're going to remove a tree if they're going to build a project or that and it's you know an eight and a half by 11 green sheet of paper and there's nothing that's codified that says 
it needs to be an eight and a half by 11 green sheet of paper. So, um, you know, if staff had heard from the commission that we don't think those are notices that people can see and, you know, understand, uh, on your own, you could go ahead and say, well, we're going to start using, you know, an 11 by 17 sheet of white paper that's going to, the notice is going to go on. Um, I know it's petty, but one of my biggest complaints has always been this green color that was used, because you can't see it when you drive down the street or it goes in landscaping or that kind of thing. But that, that kind of change can happen without any zoning ordinance amendment, right? Yeah, that, that's one of the advantages of not having it in the code is that we could make that um, administrative change. Okay. Well, we probably should open the public here. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Do you have any further questions? Did you have okay. um, so opening the public hearing, do we have anybody that'd like to speak? Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Terry Thomas, 50 plus year resident um, I have five recommendations regarding the design permit. Um, 17120040B, notice of proposed development that you just discussed. The applicant shall post a notice of proposed development that is visible to the public from the right of way. Okay. Eight and a half by 11, you can't see it from the right of way, period. It needs to be readable size from the right of way so that people that are driving by or walking on the sidewalk can see it. Otherwise, you're looking at something, you have to go up to it and read it in the bushes or wherever it is, like 18 inches away. So that's first. Second, um, uh, in 17120050, it says that um, review criteria are advisory. I think we should have something a little stronger in the wording, require, like requirement or some strongly recommended um, or some kind of equivalent. Number three. Do you please speak into the microphone? I don't think they can oh, hear sorry. you in the back. It's okay. Short. Or, okay. Number three. 17120070 design review criteria. Neighborhood compatibility. I'd like it if you put the line back in. The project is designed to respect and complement adjacent properties. Because 600 Park Avenue apartment is surrounded by 18 single family residences. Makes a difference. Uh, number four is G of the same. Um, Putting back in features that promote a sense of ownership of our outdoor space. The places that are multifamily residential need to have open space or play space because it will be needed and kids need to be able to play in their neighborhood. Uh, number five, um, it was notified, it was set up on the thing that I didn't see in the printout. Public notice, proposed no. I would like to to say proposed yes. He, the public needs to be notified about um, hearings and things that are being brought forth so that we have a way to respond to those things in need. And then my other question would be, if you have a contract review by a design professional, it adds to the expense of the city, and I'm not sure how we're going to pay for that. When the when the ARP and Senate Review Committee did it themselves. Thank you. Hello, Commissioners. Janine Roth of Santa Cruz EMB. Thank you for your time today. Um, you've all, I hope, seen the letter that we sent. I just want to highlight a couple of the words that I've just heard. Um, advisory, don't really need to tape the comments, would be more discretionary. And 
the reality is that what the California state laws around housing have done, or what, what it means under some of the housing laws, like the state density bonus laws, is that discretion is quite limited. Health and safety, some environmental concerns, things that, that really do matter are, are part of the review. But mostly it's objective standards, and if things are compliant with zoning and objective standards, your general plan, I'm afraid that the review and the opportunity to change is quite limited. And so when I read about a city contracted professional writing a written report, two to four thousand dollars, these are extra costs and time that are going into projects that you guys need in the city as part of providing homes for people. So I just, I think it's worth revisiting what is proposed here today, which is overhead and longer timeframes. And you're gonna be constrained in some instances by what state law, state law allows. I'm not sure if you were referring to the ministerial process, but I also don't see anywhere in here who's responsible or where the ministerial approval process takes place, which is also part of state law and less discretion. There's a lot of subjective language still in the design review criteria. I think the last speaker was speaking in favor of more subjective criteria. I advise that there should be less. Um, and then in terms of the LCP, I appreciate that, that you don't want to adopt the specific language, but again, I have a concern, we have a concern. If there's a conflict between the coastal, the LCP and your zoning code, it's the LCP that, that is, it, it trumps. And so, if you're changing, if your LCP includes adopted standards that are gonna be changed by state laws like density bonus, that's a problem because the LCP rules. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Hearing none, we're gonna close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for deliberation. So, um, um, I think that, um, you know, the design review process is extremely important. And I think it's something that we need to give the community an opportunity to be involved in, particularly since we're looking at making some significant changes in densities and zoning in town. And, um, you know, I, I, I've, um, battled myself, you know, back and forth because Capitola has approved two new uh, affordable housing projects recently. That's sort of the largest projects we've ever approved. And, you know, both of them went through the process of having a design professional look at it. And, and we worked with the applicant. And I think that the city got a significantly better project for the community without it being a huge cost to the developer in talking to them. Uh, you know, the changes that were made were, were not cost prohibitive. And so, you know, I hate to see some of all of that go away because we still are a small community of, you know, 1.6 square miles. This is not a, sort of a major um, metropolis. Um, but I'm diverting there a little bit. Um, so for me tonight, I, I think we should concentrate on um, dealing with issues that we need to get done before uh, in 2024 to get it to be in compliance with our housing element. Um, I, I don't think we can go through tonight, and I appreciate you all, you know, delaying this till I was here and now, Commissioner. Uh, ST is not here, um, but
But I, th I think this is something that needs a good, thorough dialogue and discussion uh, in the community. We probably need to figure out a way how to engage the community and do some more public outreach. And um, I really think this, uh, um, Commissioner Jensen is right. This is something that ought to be talked about when we're talking about looking at the individual areas and you know the increase in, in density that's going to go on there. So uh, for me, I would I would like to proceed tonight with option three, um, which. Um, uh, means that we would only deal with the um, density bonus section tonight and then make a recommendation for this all to go forward to the city council. So you're suggesting leave the uh, design review process the way it is for now? Leave it the way it is for now. And then next year when there's more time, there can be more community input. Um, you know, there's going to be new people involved in it. They would all have an opportunity to have their input. And I would suggest that the city take down the architectural and site review notice that's still on the bulletin board outside in the lobby when you come in, since there is no architectural and site review committee right now. So that, that's the direction I would go tonight. I 100% agree with you, Commissioner Weston. Okay, so well, let me let me chime in a little bit. So the reason I uh, I voted against delaying it to this meeting is I, I assumed that it was a foregone conclusion that the rest of you would vote for reinstating the the architect as part of the design review. Um, I'm glad that in retrospect that we didn't delay because it gave uh, EMB a chance to to write, and we did not coordinate, even though our letters are very similar. Um, uh, and, but it gave me also a chance to collect my thoughts and, and put them on paper and put my arguments arguments down. Um, I, again, I guess it's a victory to say, all right, let's kick this down the road, um, get more public input, get more architect input. Um, I'm happy with the with that notion of um, you know let's leave things the way they are for now. Um, I also was intrigued with the comment about uh, the cost of for the when we go with RRM all the time on, and and you 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 thought that was a great idea when we go to multifamily. Is it RRM? Is that our consultant? Um, and I just keep remembering when their comments when they came in. We were looking at, for example, um, the entryway to the various apartments, and the original approach was to have two columns, but there were wooden wooden columns. And RRM came in and said, you know, you really should put a, a brick base on those columns. That would make it look nicer. And they, they agreed. They said, okay, that's fine. But to me, that was, again, one of these subjective things that no one asked for, uh, that is, that is uh, costly, counterproductive, and, and just creates delays and, um, and frustration, I think, on the applicant on the applicant's part. But I like the idea of putting more, more community input. Let's get more, more on this. In the meantime, let's leave the code the way it is because I like the code the way it is with the exception of maybe getting rid of RRM or the equivalent. Um, and so I, um, I also agree with option three. Yeah, I, I, I'll counter a little bit. I don't think having good design, um, you know, that works in our community um, is a bad is a bad thing and um, you know when an applicant hears from someone else whether it's another architect or another professional in their field and gives them some advice about uh, some design changes they can do that are not really huge cost implications in the project that it's wrong to have those take place because I think it makes a better place for people to live. Uh, nobody wants to live in an ugly building. Um, Subjective. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know. Really didn't design an ugly building intentionally, although perhaps there are some. Oh, yeah, maybe I'll give you that. Maybe I'll give you that one. I think. <laughs> let's get to, we probably need to get to the density bonus. 
I do have a couple of comments. I'm sorry, just to, I think, I think one thing, um, just to um, go back to what your comment was, Katie, can you just um, enlighten us back when um, Commissioner Weston was talking about the project, like the Bluff project, um, didn't that project come in first with zero parking uh, as proposed at one time? I don't think that concept ever made it as a formal application. I think in, in like pre design reviews, they had floated that idea and we steered them away from that. Right. So I, I guess the point I was getting to is that, I mean, I think the staff did a remarkable job in working with um, the developer on proposing additional parking, what the impacts were of the neighborhood, and try and listen to what the community's voices were to try and make it a better project. So I just think that, again, input from staff, input from the community can make a project better. Um, I think just going back to Commissioner Wilkes' comment about victory, I don't, I don't look at it as a victory. I look at it, <clears throat> it's an opportunity for more community input in the future. Um, we have uh, community members that come forward to talk about wanting to have this enhanced, and I think that opportunity making sure that all voices can be heard um, at a later date and maybe in more of a structured environment when we go out to each community around um, is going to be uh, probably a victory that way that everybody's voice will be heard and then it can be brought back around at that one time. So those are my final comments around this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Christensen, may I say a few yeah. things? Um, I just want to comment. Um, we've heard comments about not having subjective criteria when it's an affordable housing or a density bonus. And I just want to say that when we have done a third party review of our affordable housing tied to density bonuses, we do not look at the subjective criteria. We, we've got mixed use, I'm sorry, multifamily objective standards that were adopted by the city and that is what those projects have been reviewed against. And um, I definitely respect uh, Yimby's comments about the LCP. We've done, we've done a lot of work over the past five years on cleaning up our code. And one thing we have tried to avoid is putting too many references to other sections of code because when you go back to clean it up, sometimes you miss those references. So um, I thought the comments that um, likely we could have put the recommendation of what Santa Cruz does within our density bonus to reference the LCP and get like into the details of that we'll only look at objective standards and measurable standards, but the way in which we've set up our code to make it easier for the public to utilize and um, not have too many cross references to other sections is the reason why staff is not suggesting that be implemented. So I just wanted to make that clear because I do think it was a, a thoughtful comment that came in and um, we definitely looked at it as staff very closely and it just, it's one of those things we're trying to avoid within um, the Coastal Commission has consistently tried to put many references to in our code, which we've um, just just respectfully asked them if we can keep the code the way it is just for the simplicity of knowing that different sections regulate different types of projects. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to continue on to speak about the second point or? You have. Do we need to talk about LCP? No. I think we could entertain a motion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do, you, uh, do we have wording on the approving the resolution? It was up on the screen. want to make certain we approve the resolution with the right words so it doesn't mm -hmm. impact the writers we've had that happen so okay, okay. so uh, we're uh, recommending the adoption of a resolution recommending to the city council okay <laughs> We are, uh, the motion is to um, adopt a resolution recommending to the City Council that they adopt the proposing code amendments, including the density bonus um, item. Um, and to remove and references. To, and to remove references from the, about regarding design review. I will second. Okay, we have a first and a second. Roll call. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. 
Vice Chair Jensen? Aye. Chair Christensen? Aye. Thank you. So, now that we've dealt with that item, I, I would appreciate, Peter, if you don't send letters to the whole commission, because if you send out something to all of us, then we, that's our communication under the Brown Act, and so you limit any other commissioner having the opportunity to talk to one other person. And um, I apologize. Um, it, it would be helpful to not have that happen again, because sometimes for me, it's helpful to talk to one of the other commissioners uh, uh, to get some clarification. No, historically, I've, I've gone directly to Katie, but I don't know what the last couple of times that just slipped my mind and I just sent it to everybody. That was a mistake <laughs> on my part. I apologize. Yeah. Well, your apology is accepted. I just, I just need to have my options open too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, moving on. We have item seven of the director's report. Yes, um, I have a few updates for you. Um, so first, I just, with the on-ramp for the southbound Highway 1, we're all adjusting, and it's estimated from the RTC that that on-ramp will be closed for southbound for two months. So we're one week into it and have some time ahead of us. Um, the grand opening for the Rispin, we're looking towards the end of October, early November. So hopefully I'll have a concrete date for you in the near future, but the goal is out there. Um, the um, amphitheater has been poured, the railing has been poured, it's really coming along, it's beautiful. Um, I think they're next working on landscaping. So we're hoping to get that open um, within the month. Um, the community center is now closed at Jade Street. They moved into the neighboring uh, school district building. So they're still at the park, or the local offices, but we'll be moving forward with um, remediation efforts there. Very exciting, we got a $3.3 million grant for the Jade Street Community Center. So um, that's a CDBG grant that's very exciting. Um, and then I mentioned the strategic plan, and I'll just restate, please get the word out, tell all your friends. You just go to the cityofcapitola.org, Click on the strategic plan, it, it'll take them to the survey. Um, we'd love to see that the number uh, get really high on, on how many of our fellow residents fill out this um, the survey and provide feedback because it'll be utilized as a tool for future um, decision making within the city to really understand uh, what where the where our residents would like to see Capitola in the future. There is one section in there that's tied to the Capitola Wharf and where people can provide comment on what they would like to see on the future of the wharf. So that will be helpful, helpful in our long-term planning for the wharf. And then um, just some updates on what's coming up at the next few meetings. I did want to bring to your attention that next week there's pretty exciting um, city council meeting in terms of um, um, can you remind me the, the name of the, uh, the first presentation that will be? We're going to have a staff presentation on a recent trip to the Netherlands. Vice Mayor Brooke and a member of our public works staff took a trip that was paid for through Ecology Action to observe bicycle transportation methods in the Netherlands. And they'll be presenting on that trip at our next city council meeting. So that'll be exciting. And then following that presentation, um, we'll have the we'll be discussing a 41st Avenue uh, request for qualifications to look at a corridor study and really thinking about the future of 41st Avenue and the multimodal transportation on 41st Avenue, as well as uh, placemaking and branding for 41st Avenue. So really taking a look at economic development into the future. This is something um, that will create a blueprint for 41st Avenue. And then from that, we plan to see like incremental changes and incremental plans that would be more fine tuned, but really just setting the stage for what 41st Avenue could be. And also considering all the, the 
development that we're projecting within our housing element. So trying to plan ahead. Um, and also the COSMONT study. So we referenced this, uh, we were working on the COSMONT study for the uh, land use um, study on how to assist the mall in redevelopment through different land use practices. So that will be published tomorrow on our website. And there'll be a presentation from Cosmon on that. So really looking at, again, economic development tools for the mall and tied to land use. Um, and then at our uh, next planning commission meeting on um, November 7th, we'll be discussing the tree ordinance. And at that time, it'll just be an open work session. And also, um, at this point, we don't have any def definite projects moving forward at that meeting. So um, I'm sure we will, though, by the time we get around to it. So that's the projections looking forward. And that concludes the director's report tonight. Thank you. Just one question. Um, is that grant, the one you talked about, JC, is that additional or is that the one that we got before it just got funded? This is one that we, um, we were waiting on the standard agreement for. So the, the agreement is now in place and signed, and um, so it's moving forward. So it's fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be applying for, the, for more money for the park as well. So um, I do hope we can go forward with improving what our public, our noticing signs look like. I hope the other commissioners agree with me that that's an important thing so people can see them when they drive down the street. Yeah. I agree. Not only that, but, but you mentioned earlier the, the notion of uh, getting community feedback early in the process on, on all design activities. I agree with that as well. Um, you know, obviously we disagree on some things, but certainly community input is important. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, and I, with that, we're adjourned um, to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the Planning Commission on November 7th, 2024 at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>